This week in our case, our patient had a pendular horizontal nystagmus. So what I want to talk about is the nystagmus reflex from the vestibular nerve, and also I'm going to talk about pendular um, nystagmus specifically, which is does not follow this reflex arch. It is probably uh, other areas in the brain stem or cerebellum, but we're going to talk about exactly what that is. And I tried my best to find a good uh, meme for vision and stuff, but that's all I could find, so watch out for the hot irons. There's three basic causes for nystagmus. There's a visual cause, which is called the optokinetic reflex. And that's basically like if you're driving down the street, di driving down the road past a picket fence, as the picket fence is going by, as you try to keep your eyes fixed on the newest thing coming by, it'll actually give you a, a normal nystagmus. So the optokinetic uh, nystagmus is typically normal, and if it's absent, that would be abnormal. Now the vestibular system usually has a reflex, and so what it does is whenever you're uh, rotating laterally, when you're rotating in a circle, you're, uh, you're in order to keep your eyes fixed on what, you're, what is uh, in front of you, you have a reflex that causes your eyes to move in the opposite direction. So if you're moving, if your head is moving this way, then your eyes will be moving this way in order to keep a fixed gaze on whatever you're looking at. If you didn't have this reflex, then any time you looked at, uh, any time you're reading a book, if that book was, if your head just moved slightly, just wiggled side to side ever so slightly, you wouldn't be able to focus on words. And some people have this problem. Also, you get a nystagmus when you spin. So the vestibular nystagmus you get if you spin in a circle really fast for a short period of time and then you stop and the, the world keeps spinning. This is all you have a nystagmus during that time. And so that's part of why it looks like the world is spinning to you. If you get a lesion in the vestibular system, then it'll cause what's called jerking nystagmus. And so there's two major types of nystagmus. One's jerking and one's pen pendular. And so if you get a cerebellar problem, uh, that can result in what's known as a pendular nystagmus. So, like I said, there's two main causes of nystagmus. Um, again, uh, the first cause is going to be the, the first main type of nystagmus is going to be the jerk type of nystagmus and so this is classified by uh, the type of eye movement that you get and also by the triggering factor so triggering factor could be uh, looking straight ahead it could be looking in a particular direction other uh, triggering factors would be like body position uh, so positional and the way these work is usually you will get a movement of your eye slowly in one direction and then it'll snap back quickly to the other direction. This is called the slow phase and the fast phase respectively. And so when you're talking about the direction of a nystagmus, the fast phase is what defines that direction. So an upbeat would be if, if you have a slow phase moving down and a fast phase moving back up and downbeat would be the opposite of that. In the last video I told you that in order to remember the orientation of the semicircular canals and how they're affected by different head movement, I gave you sort of a little memory device and I said that if you have your elbows out laterally and you have your fists touching each other, then rotation in that vector would stimulate your lateral horizontal semicircular canals. And that's still 100% true. However, I gave you a sort of a quick and easy shortcut on the superior and posterior semicircular canal that is only approximately true. And I wanted to correct that because in order to understand the stagnus, you have to understand the exact orientation of the semicircular canal. So I said for the superior that if you put your hands, your, your fists on your head, and you rotate it in that vector, that you would stimulate the superior semicircular canals by basically shaking your head yes. Now the superior semicircular canals are not exactly out in front of you. They're actually at a 45 degree angle away from you. And so rocking sort of forward and to the side at a 45 would stimulate this right-sided post uh, superior semicircular canal. And then the left-sided would be to the other direction. Now, 
The, the posterior is said if you put your hand straight behind you and were side to side, that would stimulate the posterior semicircular canals. And that's almost true as well, but it, instead of being straight out to the side like this, it's actually back at a 45 degree angle. So if I lean back at a 45 degree angle, that would stimulate that posterior semicircular canal. And so what I'm trying to show you is that the anterior and the posterior, so the anterior of my, or the, I'm sorry, the superior of my left ear and the posterior of my right ear are actually in line with each other, but they're orthogonal. So we're, we're getting three degrees, three planes of, of movement. So with the left ear posterior or superior and the right ear posterior, I get one plane of movement. And then at a 90 degree angle to that, the superior of my right ear, the posterior of my left ear, I get another plane of movement. And then with the lateral horizontal semicircular canals, I get another plane of movement. And you have to understand exactly that in order to understand how nystagmus works. So I got this image out of Blumenfeld, and this is, uh, um, I was actually the model that was posing for these images. And the fact that our posterior semicircular canal is at a 45 degree backwards on either side, that explains why on the Dick Hallpike test that you have to rotate the patient's head at a 45 degree and then drop them backwards because that activates the posterior canal and inhibits the anterior or it's in most texts called the superior canal. And so I just want to be clear that anytime I, the word anterior and superior is referring to the semicircular canal, they're referring to the same thing. And so over here where it says left anterior, it is also referring to the left superior. It's the same thing. So here's my left eye. And in my left eye, I have a muscle attached called the superior rectus. I have the inferior rectus, the medial rectus, the lateral rectus, and then I have, of course, a superior oblique that attaches here, goes up and around a, a little loop-de-loop. -loop. And then I also have an inferior rectus that kind of does the same thing around a little loop-de-loop. -loop. Uh, I'm sorry, I said superior and inferior. This is superior oblique, inferior oblique. Now the muscle that a specific semicircular canal is acting on is a muscle that is approximately in the same plane as that canal. So if I were talking about the lateral semicircular canal, so this let's say that this is my semicircular can, lateral canals from the left and from the right. So just to be clear, this is in my left ear, it's the lateral horizontal semicircular canal. This is in my right ear, it's the lateral semicircular canal. So let's just imagine for a moment that my right semicircular canal is activated. This is the one that's being activated. When the right is activated, it will activate the left uh, lateral rectus. It will inhibit the left medial rectus and it will activate the right medial rectus and inhibit the right lateral rectus so that both eyes will point, will look in that direction towards the left. So what happens when I have a lesion? So let me redraw my eye really quickly. So I have a lesion in my, so here's my left, here's my right, here's my, my let me zoom out a little bit, here's my left eye, here's my right eye, and make them all different colors and crap. So I got my left eye, got my right eye. I have my left and right semicircular canals. And since these semicircular canals are in the lateral plane, I know that the only muscles that are acted on will be the lateral recti, the lateral rectuses, and the medial recti in both eyes. Now there's a base input of information from both sides. So this is constantly coming over here and saying activate and it is constantly coming over here and saying inactivate so turn off and it's coming over here and saying activate with a star coming over here and saying inactivate with an X 
And you're getting the same thing from the left side, so it equals each other out. As long as there's no movement, you get this base input, and they equal each other out, and there's no movement of the eye unless you tell your eyes to move. But what happens if I get rid of the right semicircular canal? All of a sudden, my, my input to look to the left is gone, and all I have now is input from the uh, system saying look to the right. So I get this slow moving of the eyes to the right, and then I get a snap back to the left. And so with a lesion to the right semicircular canal, you get a left beating horizontal jerking nystagmus. Now let's talk about like a right anterior or you may call it superior canal. If we, if we were to somehow knock that out, then what would you get? You would get, it's constantly innervating the superior recti of both sides and so you would you would lose that constant upward pull and so you would get this slow downward and then a fast snap back upward so you would get an upbeat uh, nystagmus. But it, not only that, it's innervating this superior oblique and so whenever you get that you have a slow uh, downward clockwise rotation with a fast counterclockwise, so that's called the counterclockwise torsional phase. Now if you were to do the posterior, the posterior uh, semicircular canal would give you, uh, instead of upward beats, you would get downward beats, but you would also get a counterclockwise rotation, a counterclockwise torsion. And so with the left, you would get the, the torsion you would get from the left anterior and posterior canal would be towards the other direction, would be clockwise. Now let's stick on our right side. So we have, we have our uh, anterior or superior, we have our posterior, and we have our lateral. What happens if we take all of those out? Well, what's going to happen is that the up and down are going to cancel each other out, but the counterclockwise movement is going to summate so you're going to have a counterclockwise with a left beat combined. So you're going to have a mix of a counterclockwise torsional and left beat at the same time. And so it's important to know that you can get, uh, you can get these jerking nystagmuses by damaging the vestibular system. Or you can also get it by the vestibular tract inside of the vestibular, the vestibular tract within the brain stem and so there's you can whenever you do the brain stem it can be uh, bilateral you can have bilateral lesions and so you can get some crazy mixed uh, nystagmuses whenever you have stuff going on the brain stem rather if you just had it on a unilateral side of your head someone you had some type of trauma or you had some type of uh, infection then you would you would have uh, just less going on so what I've got here is the rostral medulla, the rostral medulla, the pons, the midbrain, and I've got my vestibular portion. I've got scarpa's ganglion. I'm going to put SG, scarpa's ganglion. And so if we come in, zoom in a little bit, what we're going to have is from scarpa's ganglion, we're going to have two projection fibers coming out, and they're going to synapse at this place right here that is called the medial vestibular nucleus. Then from here what I'm going to get is I've got the abducens nucleus which is right here so I'm going to, I'm going to draw abducens nucleus and I'm going to have inhibitory fibers coming up and synapsing right here and it's going to kind of send off two negative projections. From the projection on the left, first just let me draw in this other nucleus. This is going to be the oculomotor nucleus. So what we're going to get is from here we're going to have the fiber cross the midline, come up, and synapse in the oculomotor nucleus on the left side. And from here the the uh, nerve will come up and synapse with the medial uh, recti on the, uh, on the opposite side. Then if we go back down, so we said there was two synapses here. This is the abducens nucleus, so what's it going to do? It's going to come up, it's going to go all the way around, and it's going to synapse 
on the lateral rectus on this side. So what we've just done so far is we've inhibited the medial rectus on this eye and the lateral rectus on this eye. Now let's go back and, and finish the pathway because we have another nerve that has synapsed in the medial uh, vestibular nucleus. So what's going to happen with the second one is it's going to cross the midline and it's going to come up here and give two synapses into the abducens uh, nucleus on, uh, on the uh, contralateral side. Then this medial one is going to first come up and cross the midline, synapse in the oculomotor nucleus, and then from the oculomotor nucleus it's going to come up and synapse on the medial, uh, the, the medial rectus of the eye. And then of course we go back down to where we were and this, uh, this one's going to go all the way up to the lateral rectus and synapse here. And so since it looks like this guy is looking at us, we're going to call this the right, we're going to call this the left. And so you can see what the point I'm trying to make is, zooming all the way out, if this left, the left ear in the left vestibular uh, system in the lateral semicircular canal, semicircular canal, whenever it is activated, it's going to cause movement to the left side or to the right side. And if it is if it has a lesion in it, it's going to cause a slow movement to the left with a beat, a rightward beat. So you get, it causes movement to the right and it also causes nystagmuses with a right beat if it has a lesion. So what's the treatment for nystagmus? Well, if it's a pendular nystagmus, uh, the medicine's going to be different than if it's a jerking nystagmus. So pendular nystagmus, for example, the mainstay treatment is IV anticholinergics. However, with those uh, pendular nystagmus, so pendular nystagmus, IV anticholinergics, gabapentin, and mimantine uh, are, the, are the main treatments. Now, there are some other treatments that are anecdotal at this point and require more uh, studying to know for sure if they're going to be good or not. Another thing you can do in both types of nystagmus is you can just uh, Botox the muscle that's causing the problem. And uh, the thing is that most people that have gotten this treatment, a, a good majority of them do not go and repeat the treatment when the Botox wears off. Another thing is optics. So there's different kinds of optics that you can use. For example, um, you, can, you can do a, uh, an, something that tracks your eye movement. So if your eye moves over to the right, you can have a machine that tracks that movement over to the right and causes a prism to change shape so that you keep your field of gaze right here. And so your field of gaze doesn't move no matter where your eye is, and so that prevents you from having the vision problems. Another thing is that most people with an astagmus have something called a null position. Not everyone, but most have something called a null position, where if they position their head just right, uh, then their nystagmus will go away. And in those cases, they can fix the optics so that whenever you're in the null position, your, your field of gaze is directly in front of you. And so that you can just bend the light in the right way to hit the null position. And the last thing is surgery. And what I understood when I was reading about this is that you set up the, the muscle that is contracting so that it always pulls your eye into the central position to looking forward. And you, you basically reattach some muscles so that it always pulls your eye to central gaze and that will allow you to be able to look forward and without having um, your vision problems. It'll allow you to read books and that kind of thing. And I'm sure you can see how all of these things would cause problems. Now let's, lastly, let's talk about an acquired pendular nystagmus. So there's um, congenital pendular nystagmuses and there's acquired. And so with acquired, the thing is, um, it's usually going to be some type of cerebellar uh, lesion. And so the main theory is that you have the light coming in from your eye and that visual input is communicating with the brain stem and the cerebellum. And through all of that communication, uh, it's keeping your eyes fixed where they need to be, but whenever there's problems with that,
there's communication problems, you get this pendular nystagmus where your eyes will move in a sigmoid shape. So I'll write that out, sigmoid. And there are different types of sigmoid shapes, and all the sources say it's kind of an exercise in pattern recognition. So when it comes down to an acquired pendular nystagmus, MS is the most common cause. So most patients with uh, this acquired nystagmus will, have, will also have MS. Uh, but you can also get it from stroke, encephalitis, vascular malformations in the cerebellum, vascular malformations in the brainstem, chronic toluene. So uh, these down are exceedingly rare, but chronic toluene encephalopathy, uh, palaisius, uh, Merzbacher and other leukodystrophies, and then you can have the orbital myositis. It boils down to this. Anything that's going to interfere with the cerebellum or the light cerebellum communication system can, it will not always, but it can cause this pendular nystagmus.